It's been another good week at the sanctuary. We're getting frequent rains, but not so much that anything is flooding. This is fortunate. The Mohawk Valley seems to be one of the only places in New York that is not in a drought. The rains are forcing the slugs to higher grounds all over the sanctuary, except on the bridges where it seems that the snails tend to dominate. Deer are still present here on the sanctuary, but in lower numbers. Food is probably plentiful in the surrounding areas, and so there's no longer a need for them to congregate here. And here's a coyote bed. The coyote probably found a deer carcass somewhere and dragged the leg off it all the way over here to gnaw on it all night. Since the neighboring farmer plowed his field, we can see turkeys there almost every day. The upturned dirt probably facilitates their foraging for insects. They are extremely wary though, and seem to take off at first sight of us. And there are certainly plenty of groundhogs around here. They are also often referred to as woodchucks. The name woodchuck has nothing to do with them chucking wood, but probably stems from the mispronunciation of the Algonquin word for the animal, woochak. Groundhogs are members of the squirrel family. They seem to be a little larger, a little less social, and a little bit less omnivorous, though, than most other squirrels. But, like other squirrels, they do possess the ability to climb trees very proficiently. They also are proficient swimmers. The burrows they dig can render them a nuisance to people, but in nature their burrows are very important. Not only do they provide homes for other animals, such as skunk, fox, and rabbits, but it also upturns the soil, which is important to cycle the nutrients through the soil and keep it rich. The fields are getting more and more interesting with more flowers in bloom such as this mountain mint and Joe Pieweed which is attracting great pollinators. And in the late mornings, when the sun's getting high enough to dry up the dew, you may find something like this. A pearl crescent butterfly trying to warm its wings up enough so that it can finally take off and go on about its day. But I also had to go on about my day, so I don't know how long until it actually made it into the air. I just know it was more than four minutes. Undoubtedly, the most famous butterfly in this field is the monarch. In many people's minds, it is the quintessential butterfly of North America and yet there is no protection under the law for it, not domestically or internationally. Since the mid-1990s, populations west of the Rocky Mountains have dropped by an estimated 50%, and populations east of the Rockies by 90%. The main reason for these drops in population are habitat loss, and the use of pesticides, especially in large-scale agriculture. If actions are not soon taken to remedy these problems, 
their extinction will likely happen within the next 10 to 20 years. And unfortunately, monarchs aren't the only pollinating insects to face this grim reality. Many bee species are also in trouble. And I'm sure there's many more that we don't even know about. But as long as they are around, so are their predators, such as this amber-winged dragonfly. Notice the abdomen pumping. It's absorbing oxygen through the spiracles in its abdomen, and then it pumps in order to slosh around the blood-like substance known as hemolymph to oxygenate the rest of its body. Another predatory insect, the robber flies, are also around. Many species of robber flies help to control insect populations, not just because they are fierce predators, but they will lay their eggs of parasitic larvae inside the larvae of beetles. And these goldenrod beetles should have plenty of offspring to be utilized by the robber fly. And there are some beautiful spiders in the field that pose great danger to every other insect and invertebrate around. And some extraordinarily patterned grasshoppers. I believe that this is the differential grasshopper. The coloration and patterns can be variable within this species and even with different ages. But notice the slightly slanted face and medium-sized antenna and the herringbone pattern on the femurs. This one appears to be a male. At the tip of the abdomen, there are no ovipositors, the structure in females used for laying eggs. Grasshoppers don't sing songs, they actually play their songs more like an instrument. The leg is rubbed up against the wing akin to a bow and a violin. And here's a very similar grasshopper, probably of the same genus, Melanoplus. And like most any other animal, they do need to clean themselves from time to time. As I mentioned last week, the swamp is full of unique species. I ventured farther in this week to explore more. These blueberry bushes seem to be what's attracting all the unique birds. The dominant trees seem to be butternuts and red maples. And it seems there used to be elms, but most of them have died. But the main reason I came here was to re-examine the mystery fern. It turned out to be a Clinton's wood fern. It was named for the 19th century naturalist from Buffalo, George G. W. Clinton. These ferns characteristically grow in wet and swampy habitats. The stipes are sparsely scaled the pinna tend to be turned toward the horizontal, and there is a huge size disparity between the fertile and sterile fronds. So far, this is still the only example we've been able to find on the property. While I was there, I took the opportunity to take a gander at the cinnamon fern, and the even more rare royal fern.
And I noticed some beautiful mosses there, including this sphagnum, which I suspected should be in the swamp, but hadn't previously been able to find it. I guess the old legend is true, that finding a spider on your hand really does bring good luck. I purchased a drone to get good aerial shots of the sanctuary. It was the best one that my favorite non-president could buy. I'm pretty happy with it, but I still need a lot of practice to control it better. These are the beaver ponds that are being recorded. The waviness is not a malfunction of the camera, it's just that humid out. Closer to ground, this catbird has some sort of insect that it has captured and will be eating. These downy woodpeckers are busy foraging in a snag for insects. The house wrens are finding their insects in shrubs like honeysuckle. While well, this house sparrow fledgling is content waiting for his parents to bring his meal to him. Up above the beaver pond, the smurder of crows is trying to chase out a great horned owl. Usually, when you hear a mob this raucous, it's safe to assume it's a large owl that they're after. I never saw it, but Matt did. And at the other end, the beavers are expanding their pond, flooding the fields to make new canals in which they can travel. populations seem to be down this summer, but at least our one patch of broad beach fern has expanded. And the cut leaf grape ferns are starting to sprout. New mushroom species are still emerging on a daily basis. These fungi are not only important as decomposers and nutrient recyclers, but also are a very important food source for many animals. Many of the mushrooms I've identified are in fact edible and apparently very tasty, but I prefer not to eat them. For one, a mistake could be deadly. And secondly, I don't want to make my ecological footprint larger than it needs to be. I prefer not to tamper with the few natural places that we have left. Furthermore, I'd like to see the mushrooms spread. That way I can and others can enjoy them for the future. And that wraps up another great week at the sanctuary. Thank mm -hmm. you.